Hi, and welcome back to Just Another Stitch. For those that don't know me, my name is Connie, and if you're new to my channel, I'd like to welcome you. Well, I am going to start reading a book, and I'm going to be doing these videos on Wednesday. And the book that I'm choosing to read is The Circular Staircase by Mary Roberts Weinhardt. And this is a mystery book. So I'm going to be reading one chapter each week. Okay. So the first chapter is Take a Country House. This is, this is the story of how a middle-aged spinster lost her mind, deserted her domestic gods in the city, took a furnished house for the summer out of town and found herself involved in one of those mysterious crimes that keep our newspapers and detective agencies happy and prosperous. For 20 years, I had been perfectly comfortable. For 20 years, I had had the window boxes filled in the spring, the carpets lifted, the awnings put up, and the furniture covered with brown linen. For as many summers, I had said goodbye to my friends, and after watching their perspiring hajira had settled down to a delicious quiet in town where the mail comes three times a day and the water supply does not depend on a tank on the roof. And then the madness seized me. When I look back over the months I spent at Sunnyside, I wonder that I survived at all. As it is, I show the wear and tear of my horroring experiences. I have turned very gray. Liddy reminded me of it only yesterday by saying that a little bluing in the rinse water would make my hair silvery instead of a yellowish white. I hate to be reminded of unpleasant things, and I snapped her off. No, I said sharply, I'm not going to use bluing at my time of life or starch either. Liddy's nerves are gone, she says, since that awful summer, but she has enough left, goodness knows. And when she begins to go around with a lump in her throat, all I have to do is to threaten to return to Sunnyside, as she is frightened into a semblance of cheerfulness, from which you may judge that the summer there was anything but a success. The newspaper accounts have been so garbled and incomplete. One of them mentioned me but once, and then only as a tenant at the time, the thing happened that I feel it my due to tell what I know. Mr. Jamieson, the detective said himself, he could never have done without me, although he gave me little enough credit in print. I shall have to go back several years, 13 to be exact, to start my story. At that time, my brother died, leaving me his two children, Halsey was 11 then, and Gertrude was seven. All the responsibilities of maternity were thrust upon me suddenly. To perfect the profession of motherhood requires precisely as many years as a child had li has lived. Like the man who started to carry the calf and ended by walking along with the bull on his shoulders. However, I did the best I could. When Gertrude got past the hair ribbon age, and Housley asked for a scarf pin and put on long trousers and the wonderful help that was to the darning. I sent them away to good schools. After that, my responsibility was chiefly po postal with three months every summer in which to replenish their wardrobes, look over their list of acquaintances and generally to take my foster motherhood out of its nine months retirement in Camp Far. I missed the summers with them when somewhat later at boarding school and college, the children spent much of their vacations with friends. Gradually, I found that my name signed to a check was even more welcome than when signed to a letter, though I wrote them at, at stated intervals. But when Hasley had finished his electrical course and Gertrude had, and Gertrude her boarding school and both came home to stay, Things were suddenly changed. The winner, Gertrude, came out with nothing but a succession of sitting up late at night to bring her home from things, taking her to the dressmakers between naps the next day. 
and discouraging ineligible use with either more money or more brain money. So I acquired a great many things to say on the for undergarments and that beardless sophomores are not college boys, but college men. Honestly required less personal supervision. And as they both got their mother's fortune that winter, my responsibility became purely more moral. Honestly bought a car, of course, and I learned how to tie over my bonnet a gray beige veil. And after a time, never to stop to look at the dogs, one has run down. People are apt to be so unpleasant about their dogs. The additions to my education made me properly equipped, made an aunt, and by spring, I was quite tractable. So when Hasley suggested camping in the Adorno Dax and Gertrude won at Boar Harbor, we compromised on a good country house with links near within motor distance of town and telephone distance of the doctor. That was how we, we went to Sunnyside. We went out to inspect the property and it seemed to deserve its name. Its cheerful appearance gave no indication whatever of anything out of the ordinary. Only one thing seemed unusual to me. The housekeeper who had been, a, who had been left in charge had moved from the house to the gardener's lodge a few days before. As the lodge was far enough away from the house, it seemed to me that either fire or thieves could complete their work of destruction undisturbed. The property was an extensive one, the house on the top of a hill, which sloped away in great stretches of green lawn and clipped hedges to the road and across the valley. Perhaps a couple of miles away was the Greenwood Clubhouse. Gertrude and Hasley were infatuated. Why, it's everything that you were in good for the it was pure Elizabethan. Of course, we took the place. It was not my idea of comfort being much too large and sufficiently isolated to make the servant question serious. But I give myself credit for this. Whatever has happened since, I never blame Hasley and Gertrude for taking me there. And another thing, in the series of catastrophes there did nothing else. It taught me one thing, that somehow, somewhere, somewhere, from perhaps a half-civilized ancestor who wore a sheepskin garment and trailed his foot or his prey. I have in me the instinct of the chase. Were I, I a man, I should be a trapper of criminals, trailing them as relentlessly as no doubt my sheepskin ancestor did his wild boar. But being an unmarried woman with the handicap of my sex, my first acquaintance with crime will probably be my last. Indeed, it came near enough to being my last acquaintance with anything. The property was owned, owned by Paul Armstrong, the president of the Traders Bank, who at the time he took the house was in the West with his wife and daughter and a Dr. Walker, the Armstrong family physician. Hosley knew Louise Armstrong had been rather attentive to her the winter before, but as Hosley was always attentive to somebody, I had not thought of it seriously. Although she was a charming girl, I knew of Mr. Armstrong only through his connection with the bank, where the children's money was largely invested, and through an ugly story about the son, Arnold Armstrong, away to a house party and moved out to Sunnyside the 1st of May. The roads were bad, but the trees were in leaf, and there were still tulips in the borders around the house. The arbutus was fragrant in the woods, under the dead leaves, and on the way from the station, a short mile, while the course stuck in the mud, I found a bank showered with tiny forget-me-nots. The birds don't ask me what calling. They all look alike to me, unless they have a hallmark of some bright color. The birds were chirping in the hedges, and everything breathed of peace. Liddy, who was born and bred on a brick pavement, got a little bit down-spirited when the crickets began to chirp or scrape their legs together or whatever, or whatever it is they do at twilight. 
The first night passed quietly enough. I have always been grateful for that one. Unfavorable circumstances. Never that night did I put my head on my pillow with any sure how long it would be there, or my shoulders for that matter. On the following morning, Liddy and Mrs. Ralston, my own housekeeper, had a difference of opinion, and Mrs. Ralston left on the 11 train. Just after luncheon, Burke, the butler, was taken unexpectedly with a pain in his right side, much worse when I was within hearing distance. And by afternoon, he was started city citywide. That night, the cook's sister had a baby, the cook. Seeing indecision, seeing indecision in my face made it twins on second thought. And to be short, by noon the next day, the household staff was down to Liddy and myself. And this is a house with 22 rooms and five baths. Liddy wanted to go back to the city at, month, at once. But the milk boy said that Thomas Johnson, the strong colored butler, was working as a waiter at the club. And when I come back, I have the usual scruples about coercing servants away. But few of us have any conscience regarding institutions or corporations. Witness the way we beat, we beat railroad, railroads and street court companies when we can. So I called up the club and about eight o'clock, Thomas Johnson came to see me. Poor Thomas. Well, it ended by my engaging Thomas on the spot at outrageous wages and with permission to sleep in the Gardner's Lodge. Empty since the house was rented. The old man, he was white haired and a little stooped but with an immense idea, immense idea of his personal dignity, gave me his reasons hesitantly. I ain't saying nothing, Miss Miss Innes, he said, with his hands on his door. But it's been going on here the last few months. As it's just the door squealing here and a window closing there. But when doors and windows get to cutting up capers and there's nobody night them, it's time Thomas Jeff Johnson sleep somewhere somewhere else. Liddy, who seemed to be never never more than, than 10 feet away from me that night, and was afraid of her shadow in that great barn of a place, screamed a little and turned a little green, but I am not easily alarmed. I, it was entirely in vain, I represented to Thomas, that we were alone and that we would that we would have to stay in the house that night. He was politely firm, but he would come over early the next morning. And if I gave him a key, he would come in time to get some sort of breakfast. Just veranda, watch him shuffle along down the shadowy drive with mingled feelings. Irritation at his cowardice and thankfulness at getting him at all. I am not ashamed to say that I double locked the hall door when I went in. You can lock up the rest of the house and go to bed, Liddy, I said severely. You gave me the creep standing there. A woman of your age ought to have better sense. It usually braces Liddy to mention her age. She owns to 40, which is absurd. Her mother cooked for my grandfather, and Liddy must be at, at least as old as I. But that night, she refused to brace. You're not going to ask me to lock up, Miss Rachel, she quavered. Why, there's a dozen French windows in the drop drawing room and the billets room wing and everyone opens on a porch and mary ann said that last night there was a man standing by the stable when she locked the kitchen door mary mary ann was a fool i said sternly if there had been a man there she she would have had him in the kitchen and been feeding him what was left from dinner in, inside of an hour from course of habit now don't be ridiculous lock up the house and go to bed i'm going to read but Liddy set her lips tight and stood still. I'm not going to bed, she said. I am going to pack up and tomorrow I am going to leave. You'll do nothing of the sort, I snapped. Liddy and I often desire to part company, but never at the same time. If you are afraid, I will go with you. But for goodness sake, don't try to hide behind me. The house was a typical summer residence on, a, on an extensive scale. Wherever possible on the first floor, 
the arch architect had done away with partitions using arches and columns instead. The effect was cool and spacious, but scarcely cozy. As Liddy and I went from one window to another, our voices go back and back at us and come uncomfortably. With plenty of light, the electric plant down in the village supplied us, but there were long vistas of polished floor and mirrors which reflected us from unexpected until I felt some of Liddy's foolishness communicate itself to me. The house was very long, a rectangular, a rectangle in general form, with the main entrance in the center of the long side. The brick paved entry opened into a short hall to the right of which, separated only by a row of, row of pillars, was a huge living room. Beyond that was the drawing room, and in the end, the billet room. Off the billet room in the extreme right wing was a den or cord room with a small hall opening on the east veranda and from there went up a narrow circular staircase as he had pointed it out with delight. Just look at it, Rachel, he said with a flourish. The architect that put up this joint was one of a few things. Armstrong and his friends had seen him play chords all night and still up to bed in the early morning without having the family send in a police call. Liddy and I got as far as the cord room and turned on the lights and turned on all the lights. I tried the small entry door there, which opened on the veranda and examined the windows. Everything was secure. And Liddy, a little less nervous now, had just pointed out to me the disgrace, disgracefully dusty condition of the hardwood floor when suddenly the lights went out. We waited a moment. I think Liddy was stunned with fright or she would have screamed. And then I clutched her by the arm and pointed to one of the window openings on the porch. The sudden change threw the window into relief. Oblong grayish light and showed us the figure standing close, peering as I looked across the veranda and out of sight, in, out of sight in the darkness. So that completes chapter one. So next week, I will be reading chapter to y'all. So I hope y'all enjoyed today's reading, and I hope everyone is having a fabulous yorny day. Be the light, and bye!